Next patient is a man, 18 years old. Since 1980, he suffered from bipolar disorder on antipsychotic drug therapy. On December 2015, appeared dysphagia, regurgitation, weight loss of 50 kilos. On April 2016, he underwent EGD with barium swallow that saw esophageal dilation, distal stricture. Type 2 achalasia was diagnosed with HR manometry. Current problem, type 2 achalasia and esophageal dilation. Eckhart score 9, 3 days, free regurgitation, pain 0, weight loss 3. Schedule procedure, pneumatic balloon dilation, learning objectives, indication for treatment of achalasia with self-expandable metal stand, limits and possible complications of endoscopic treatment. Thank you. Uh, just before moving to, to the room where Bishop and uh, Dr. Seo will perform the procedure, we want just to present a different treatment, a, an alternative treatment uh, for achalasia. Today we will see the balloon dilatation, tomorrow we will see a poem. Another treatment possible is the placement uh, temporary of a large bore stent. Uh, there are now currently on the, on the market different kind of stents that can be used for achalasia. One of the most popular uh, one that, need, uh, that is normally used for achalasia is produced by Microtech, and this is the stent. It's a very large stent, 30 millimeter in diameter. It's a partially covered stent because he has a, a, just a small ring in the proximal part that is uncovered to favor anchoring of the stent into the dilated esophagus. And it has a, a two uh, large uh, ends. The proximal is like a mushroom with a, a small wire for the stent removal. Uh, we use the stent sometimes, uh, usually not like a first line therapy, usually as a second or third line therapy. And if, he, if we can see the video, this is the, uh, I want just to show you how easy it is to remove the stent. Can you show the video please? Yeah. This is the stent that we had implanted on a, on a patient. And after 10 days from the stent placement, this is the stent removal. You see the stent, it was still in place. It was scrapped with a foreign body forceps, gently pulled under fluoroscopy guidance. And you see that at the end, it's very easy to remove the stand. This is the final result with the esophagogastric junctions completely dilated. We know s severe damages to the esophageal mucosa, and when we inject the contrast into the uh, esophageal lumen, you see the contrast quickly flow into the gastric, uh, into the stomach. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the room where Bishop and Dr. Seo will perform balloon dilatation now. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so my real pleasure to be here. And uh, Dr. Uh, Bishop Rapp will do the procedure, and I will help him, and I will assist him. OK. So uh, you already saw the treatment uh, with the stent. I think if you consider that treatment, it's really crucial to emphasize that you should at least go for a 30 millimeter stent. Yeah. Uh, there's been two studies from Asia uh, addressing uh, the use of the stents. Um, and uh, in the first one, they used a 30 millimeter stand. And in that particular uh, study, the uh, long term results weren't that bad. It was about 83% uh, after leaving the stand in place for five to six days. Uh, the other study used uh, different stands uh, of different diameters. And there it was clear that the, you needed at least a 30 millimeter stand, which corresponds actually to what we do during endoscopic dilatation. Yeah. We start with a 30 millimeter balloon. So perhaps you can show the endoscopic picture a little bit. This is a typical achalasia case with a very uh, dilated esophagus. You can see the diverticulum here that you could see on the x-ray. Uh, and you can imagine, I mean, if we discuss the different options that both from a surgical viewpoint and also to perform POEM, that this is really a, would be a very challenging case. The patient is also rather old, uh, 80 years, has uh, some comorbidity. Uh, so I think uh, this is an excellent candidate for uh, pneumodilatation yes. as a first treatment yeah. option. Uh, there are different grades of achalasia, right? Uh, yeah. Type 1, 2, 3. Mm -hmm. If the achalasia is very tight, the structure is very tight, then we can think about surgical options too. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, the, this is type 2. They did a manometry before. And, yeah. uh, and also, if you see the endoscopy, it 
there is not very strong resistance going into the uh, stricter segment. So whether to start a non-invasive uh, uh, intervention first. Yeah. Do you agree? I agree, I agree. Yeah. And actually, if we look at the randomized controlled trial comparing halomyotomy uh, to pneumodilatation, uh, they are both equally uh, efficacious in, in, in terms of uh, uh, symptom uh, control. Yeah. Uh, but that needs to, it needs to be emphasized that when you talk about a pneumat pneumatic dilatation as a treatment option, that this consists of consecutive dilatation. So in contrast yeah. to halomyotomy, which is like a one-time hit, yeah. Uh, you only have one chance with a pneumo dilatation. You start with 30, and most mm. of the patients will need a 35 millimeter dilatation. Mm. Uh, and some of them, it's a minority, around 10 to 20 percent, mm. need 40 millimeter dilatation. Yes. Um, what we do in our unit is we admit the patients usually. We start with manometry. The first day, we do 30 millimeter dilatation. Mm -hmm. Second day, if they're fine, we do a, a new manometry. Mm -hmm. If the pressure at the LAS is way above 50 millimeters of mercury, we would uh, proceed with a 35 millimeter dilatation straight away on the second day. Yeah. Uh, for the 40 millimeter, we usually await the effect uh, mm -hmm. because the risk is obviously a little bit higher. In terms of complication risk, uh, obviously there is a risk of perforation here, uh, which varies according to the published series between 2 and 5%. Uh, but I think what we learned from the uh, randomized multicenter control trial is that you really should start with a 30 millimeter dilatation first. Uh, because in the first uh, part of that study, we started immediately with a 35 millimeter dilatation, and then there was actually a very high rate of perforations. But when the protocol was adjusted to start with a 30 millimeter dilatation, uh, the uh, perforation rate oh, went really down. Rough, uh, okay. we should Ralph, you can it. go. You want me to take? Yes, yes, yes. Ralph, uh, we have an, uh, just wait, we have no, no sound. Okay, can okay. you hear us? Now it's okay, please you can go. Yeah. Okay, so the balloon we're gonna use is the Boston Scientific Rigiflex. Uh, you can see uh, this procedure is actually done under uh, radiographic control. Um, the guide wire is already in place. For this purpose, we use the separate guide wire. Uh, and you can see there are different uh, radio opaque, uh, opaque markers. Uh, and the one in the middle has two markers very close to each other, and this should be around the JA junction. Yeah. On the screen you can see uh, that we have the electrodes for the uh, cardiac monitoring, uh, and about two centimeters below that is the JA junction, so this is what we determined uh, offline. Do you see fluoro image now? Fluoro? Perhaps you can show the fluoro image. Okay, so yeah. uh, we're going to introduce yes. the guide wire now. Yes. It's also important to emphasize that the dilatation is done with air, so not with fluid. And uh, we usually start around 5 PSI. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's check. Mm -hmm. So there uh, it comes. In this case, the electrode is adequately located at the EG junction. If you write uh, a line between two, uh, E ECG electrode, that is actually the junction of uh, uh, e uh, esophagus and the stomach, the achalasia stricture site. So it's better to locate two radio opaque markers on that area. So can you see the fluoroscopic image? Oh yeah, you can see that. So you can see that the two markers are now uh, about two centimeters below the JA junction. Um, and what you could also do is you can also check when you inflate what we're going to do now up to uh, around 5 PSI. Yeah. Then you Rafa, can see I don't understand which diameter the balloon you are using. Are you using? Which diameter? It's a, it's a 30 millimeter. So you always start with a 30 millimeter balloon. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually see that the indentation is already gone here, right? Yeah. I don't know if you could see that. This is just 5 PSI, but I think yeah. uh, the balloon is now uh, almost dilated. Yeah. Uh, so there is not so much resistance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we can increase uh, up to 10 PSI. 10 PSI. And that we usually leave in for at least one minute. Mm -hmm. Can you see the, the air? So you can see the wide delineation of the balloon very clearly, I think, on your screen. And there was a short indentation which uh, we could see disappear in the beginning, and that went very quickly. Can you see the contour of the balloon on floral image? OK. So we wait for about a no, minute or so? One minute, one yeah. minute, yeah. Uh, 
And then when you come back, you should always check the balloon. We do not systematically uh, check endoscopically after the dilatation. Uh, we do most of these procedures under conscious sedation uh, with midazolam and pithidin, uh, with the patient actually sitting up uh, on a spe specifically designed chair for that in our unit. Um, and then obviously if the patient has a lot of pain after the procedure, then we would do an um, x-ray swallow uh, to see if there's any perforation or not. We do not do systematically that. I don't know how uh, you do this here in uh, Gemelli. We do EGD. Yeah. So here no. they do systematically uh, in EGD. Yeah. Yeah. A rough so uh, we removed the balloon, uh, so we dilated up to one and a half minute, uh, 10 PSI with a 30 millimeter balloon. And you can see the effect here at the level of the J junction. Uh, yes. There was no balloon on the uh, blood on the balloon, which is a good thing. Uh, yeah. But obviously, you can see that there was an effect. And the purpose of the dilatation is really to tear the muscle outside of the esophagus. So you do not really want to see too much of damage yeah. inside when you go back, because uh, yeah. that may actually be a sign of uh, perforation. So I think uh, an yeah. important, yeah, go ahead. Please. I think uh, uh, after balloon dilation, the evaluation of the effect can be done by endoscopically. But also, uh, we need to check the patient's symptom, mm -hmm. uh, whether they can eat, yeah. or uh, is there any no co any complication next day. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, I think uh, sometimes uh, pneumatic balloon dilation can cause uh, mucosal tearing or muscular tearing or perforation. Then, how do you manage those complications? That's a very good question. So uh, we published a, a nice series of our complications uh, that we had uh, of more than 70 patients. Uh, with a, with a perforation after dilatation over a period of 25 years. And what we learned from that is that we can just wait and see. Yeah. So you give IV antibiotics, nil per mouth, uh, yeah. and eventually, if necessary, uh, parental nutrition. And just by waiting and asking the patient to be patient, yeah. uh, it's, uh, yes. you can uh, resolve 90 yeah. to 95% of the cases. I think in about 5% of the cases, you may need to drain uh, uh, a thoracic uh, Sometimes effusion. we can insert fully covered stent yeah. to cover the uh, perforation area. Sometimes it is effective to yeah. healing of those areas. Huh? But I think what we learned from our experience is that just being patient helps a lot. Yes, right? But yes. it does, sometimes it takes one week Patient's or two weeks. Patient's body can yeah. Yeah. solve and that, the problem. Uh, they will, but yeah. the main thing is that I don't eat and drink. Yeah. That, that's something you really should emphasize. But you can obviously put in a covered stand if you want or try to close it with clips. Yeah. Uh, but it's not really sure if that's really helpful in comparison to just a yeah, conservative well, exactly. treatment. But, but Raf, the, the problem with being patient is if the patient gets mediastinitis, mm -hmm. that patient, you, you've lost your window to, to help the patient. So even if the number needed to treat is 25, mm -hmm. you're probably still are better off putting a stent in. In other words, it's a disaster if, if your patience doesn't pay off. Yeah, but it's, yes. it's not shown by our data, Greg, I'm sorry. <laughs> so no, 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 I, I, I want to have this experience. discussion with you. Yeah. I want you to yeah. answer me. Yeah, Yeah, uh, that's true, but uh, I mean, this is all, obviously this is always done in collaboration with the surgeons. I mean, if you have a perforation, we call upon a thoracic surgeon uh, and, and see what we need to do. But in particular, if we have patients like this, 80 mm -hmm. years old, I mean, going in uh, surgically is also, uh, is also mm -hmm. a pain. And uh, usually okay. you, you will diagnose the perforation. Uh, obviously, it's crucial that you do an early diagnosis. So if the patient mm -hmm. has a lot of pain, there's a very low threshold to go for a CT scan and to see if there's any uh, a leakage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you start immediately, within, within a few hours, you start the antibiotics. And I think okay. that, that will decrease the chance of med mediastinitis. We Thank you, Raf. Thanks, yes. Raf. Thank you, Thank Seo. You.